Hi, thanks for joining me again. In this video, we're going to go over making a master material scene in Maya, and we'll practice building a subsurface material with the V-Ray Owl Surface Shader. So here we are again in a new scene, and this is the part that I said is kind of optional, but it would be a good idea to do it if you have the time to. So you wanna do like all of your proxies, right? Then do your lighting in your main scene, get all of that set up. And then if I had time, I would try to set up my materials. And we can do that in a separate scene and then reference this scene with all of our materials into our master scene, just like anything else. So this scene's gonna be pretty empty, but we would just wanna go, for me, I would just go into the hypershade, right? And then we can add stuff. Obviously we're working in V-Ray, so we can just add a V-Ray material, right? And work with everything right in here. And really the easiest way to go about this is kind of the same as before. We wanna set up some master materials depending on what we have in our scene. So I'm gonna go and make that list like I did with all of the objects in the scene, but this time just with our materials. So I know for the character, I'm going to have a skin material. So I'm gonna have that. I'm going to have a material for the eyes. I'm going to have a material for the iris. That's going to be separate hair material, depending on how you approach hair, you're going to have a separate material for that. We're obviously going to have a material for the floor, that's wood. We're going to have two different materials for the fridge because we're going to have the metal exterior. We're gonna have this metal, which we could probably use the same painted metal for this. And then we have the plastic of the shelves and the molding inside of the fridge. We have refractive plastics. We also have refractive glass materials. We have paper for these, paper of the box. So if we can set up these master materials, we can then, same thing, duplicate those, like we talked about instancing, you know, different meshes to speed up our process. If we get these set up right away, then we can go about making duplicates for ones that have specific things. So we have like, of course, our different textures that we're going to apply to these in the albedo and whatever changes we need to make in other channels. So let's go in and take a little look at how we might do that. I know I said the scene would be pretty empty, but I'm probably gonna add something like a simple sphere, just so we can get an idea of what our materials look like as we're building them. So we'll get this guy. And I'm going to go down to my reference editor and I'm going to reference in this look dev stage. So we have lighting in the scene. And so now when we go to do an IPR, we can get an idea of what we're working with. Let's just get this in frame a little better. So now I just have like simple look dev setup. That'll be consistent across all the scenes and all the materials. And as I'm working on stuff, I can get an idea of what it's going to look like. I think what'll be more helpful than going over just kind of like a basic material, I'm gonna do something with subsurface. I'm gonna go over the V-Ray Owl Surface material, which is what I would recommend for using for skin, just in case anyone is doing a character. I'm gonna create a new tab. And then of course you can rename this. We'll just name it skin. And we'll add our V-Ray Owl Surface. So this way you can create tabs for all of the different materials you're working on. So you have them open and you don't have to keep loading stuff in. The V-Ray Owl Surface shader can be really tricky to work with. It's a really powerful shader, you know, as people like to say, but with anything that is really powerful, also means it's probably a pain in the ass to work with, right? <laughs> and it's not going to work straight out of the box. So if you just load this up and apply it to a material, we can take a look at what it looks like. You get basically nothing. We have to make a lot of changes to make this work for us. And so I'm going to go through those. And just so you know, I do love the results that you can get with V-Ray. V-Ray is one of my favorite renderers. And a lot of the time I would prefer to work in this. Subsurface, not one of my favorite things to work with in V-Ray. Really heavy, especially with displacement, like my render times go through the roof. So that's an area that I feel maybe could be improved. 
definitely not going to get like asked to do a tutorial featured on their website for saying this right but be aware i just want you to be aware if you have subsurface in your scene or you're working specifically with characters prepare for longer render times and that you're gonna have to really dig in to this one especially you can use the simple like the fast subsurface but the owl surface is much better suited for character work and we'll talk about kind of why that is the main thing is going to be your multiple channels for your subsurface and your dual specular lobes but like i was saying this doesn't work straight out of the box here are the reasons for that your subsurface mix is by default set to zero for most objects that have subsurface scattering you want this set to one it's going to mostly override the surface color of the object and that is what you want uh, because that's the way that different objects like skin wax all of these things that's the way they behave all of the light actually goes into the surface and then the amount that escapes determines how kind of glowy or waxy that object is but as you can see even doing that, nothing has changed for us. The other thing we have to do, you know, and this is one of the other things with working with this shader is the documentation isn't very clear. You have to adjust the density scale for your scene. So when it's at one, it is, as far as I understand, taking the scenes scale and applying that to everything here. So my scene is in centimeters. I haven't changed that, right? So all of my subsurface is going by centimeter. What I need, and really any time that you're working uh, with subsurface, especially with skin, you need this set to millimeters. So we're gonna drop this down to actually 0.1. And now you can see we're getting a much more fleshy result. It's going to take us a long time for this IPR to catch up. <laughs> And it's going to be pretty noisy. This is just kind of one of the things with working with subsurface. But we can take a look now. These are going to be more what we're looking for. So for our shallow surface, this is at one and a half millimeters. Human skin ranges in thickness from like one, I think it's like 1.4 to one and a half millimeters thick to four millimeters thick. So we would want to adjust these a little bit, but for the most part, these should work as our starting values. And then you'll see that I've turned up the weight of the second channel. This would be our deep subsurface up to one. By default, these other channels are set to zero, so you can change these colors. You can plug a map into these, which I would probably recommend for the subsurface one channel, but you're going to need to adjust your map so uh, re renderers like Arnold and Renderman do the inversion of your albedo for you directly in the shader. So you can kind of just like plug it in. You're going to have to adjust your map to use it as a subsurface map. So you can do that either during the texturing process or what would probably be faster is to put an adjustment node in here and then run your texture into it. And as far as how to approach that, we have a few different options. We can use the V-Ray color correction node, which I personally haven't used, so I'm not familiar with using this one. I would use probably just the standard color correct, so I'm just hitting tab, searching color correct. And I would do this, so you would add a file we're just not going to have anything in here, but this would be right our albedo, our diffuse color, and then we would want to run the out color into the in color here in the color correct. And then in the color correct itself, we can make some adjustments. We're going to want to kind of increase the saturation, possibly shift the hue, and deepen the value. So generally, I would do that with gamma. Uh, the thing and the difference between gamma and value is gamma keeps your extremes. So your darkest darks and your lightest lights are going to stay the same. 
or at least like the ratio between them stays the same. So this would be a good option. And then once we make that change, we would run the out color then into our subsurface color one. And then our standard was the out color from this, we would run into our diffuse. And this is also how I would start setting up these materials. I would put in the empty files. I would rename them so I know what they are and what they're doing. So this would be like in, you know, diffuse text or whatever. And I already have them there and set up so that I can just plug the files in when I'm done texturing. Let's go back to the material itself. And we can play with some of these values. So we already talked about turning up your subsurface mix to one. We need to adjust the scale overall. You have some other options in here for your bump. So you can do bump or normal mapping directly in the shader itself. You can also do that within the diffuse. Uh, but if you're using displacement, then you're going to, of course, have a separate displacement assigned to the shader. We're going to want to turn up our deep color, at least in this one. You know, and even when you are using a texture to drive your first subsurface color, you can adjust this like very shallow one and your deep color. And for the most part, these work pretty well for the variety of skin tones. I'm going to actually go and change this diffuse. I have been playing around with some other tones. I'm going to put this to kind of a darker skin tone. And you can see how well the default colors work. So that's giving us kind of the proper shadowing and subsurface color, even for like a medium skin tone, which from our example is more what our character has. And then we could, of course, change this to get it more accurate in the end. But I have this stuff set up just so we can start to visualize how it's working in the scene, what values we want. We bring in some of this blue. Of course, working with dark skin tones, we want to be careful as we're bringing cool colors in just to make sure that we're not getting something that's kind of like muddy. Or sallow. The other thing is like creating sallow skin tones is really unflattering with darker skin tones. So we have to be conscious of that. And I don't see that this is doing much for us, but definitely kind of, you know, around our Fresnel area, we're getting a little bit of that bluish tint. And if you want to be really fancy, and this might be just something to keep in mind for future projects if you're doing character work, you could always plug like a deep vein map into here. So that's why this shader in particular is really useful for characters because you have tons of flexibility. For my reflection, uh, I'm not going to do too much here because there's a lot of different ways to work with the specular now, especially when you're doing like photo real characters. If you're working with stuff like VFace, the HD maps from 3D Scan Store, they come with maps that are really like your, your color ID masks, and you can use those to control an entire area of the face and adjust your roughness to those regions. And then you would want to balance that with the displacement. Since, you know, this is getting more into like look dev theory, but roughness and specifically here when we're talking about like specular gloss or specular roughness, that's an arbitrary value. It doesn't actually exist in real life. It's because we in the shader or in the software, we can't get enough micro detail on the surface to create the look of true roughness because in real life, the unevenness of the surface causing the light to bounce in different directions is what gives us that kind of diffuse look. And so that's a way that we have artistic control to create that. But now as things are advancing, we're able to rely more on the displacement in conjunction with our roughness and specular values to create that. So we're kind of like moving away from 
doing really detailed specular maps, I've noticed. But you will still probably want two channels and to utilize these. But I would set those up later when you actually have your maps for the character. The first one you're going to want to use as kind of your broad specular. Um, what is the IOR of human skin? I think it's closer to like 1.45. But we'll come back to that. So I would look up these values since I don't always remember them off the top of my head and plug these in. And then uh, I would, again, set up my files so I can connect those later. But this one is going to be your broad specular or the skin generally. And then this one is going to be your tight specular. So kind of on the ridges in between pores and things where you're getting more gloss and a bit of oiliness, this is what you would use that for. And you can get Sorry, this one, your reflection too. So activating this one, and again, we're going to want to turn up the strength on it and balance those two. This one is going to give you a lot of realism. So something to think about, but you can use it with really anything. You know, you could use it with a candle even. You know, any type of object that has subsurface, so plastics, anything like that. And it just gives you a, an extra layer of flexibility with that specular reflection. So I hope that gives you a broad overview of working with the owl surface. You're gonna wanna go in just as a review, change your scale to be appropriate to what your scene scale is. So if your scene is in meters, you're going to want to adjust this probably like 0.01, right? Am I doing that right? Probably to get to millimeters. If you're comfortable working in millimeters, it's just going to be easier for you because we tend to measure subsurface in millimeter and other shaders do it that way as well. Turn up your subsurface mix. Turn on your channels as you need them. I would start with your first one, then add in your deep, you know, and then adjust the colors as you need to, to get the correct look. And you don't have to stick with these, you can change them. You know, if you have like an alien character, you can change this to a green. In fact, on my leaves, these are like yellow, green, and I think I have like another like kind of bluish color. I'd have to go take a look. But yeah, for any of your materials, you can change these to suit what you need. My blackberries, right? These are like a raspberry red color. I have a bit of the darker black color. On the ones that have a bit of green, I have a very like pale green for this color near the surface. So play around with the values, get all of these set up. And then I would recommend going in, putting all your files in, putting whatever nodes that you need to correct or change those. You might want various correction nodes in place anyway, just because even in my experience, my roughness and my gloss maps, sorry, my gloss and my specular maps are just kind of never quite accurate. So it's a good idea to have these color corrects in place already. So you can kind of tweak the values without having to go back into Mari and export again and back into Mari. So I would say once you've gone this far and you have all of this set up, then you're pretty much at a great place for your first week. You can go back then to working on doing all of your modeling and refining or whatever else you're going to work on next. But by this point, if you follow everything through, you get all your scenes set up, you have your materials and your lighting set up, the majority of your work and the stuff that's going to eat up your time later is done. And it kind of frees you up just to do the actual work. So I hope this has helped you. In the next one, we're going to go over one of my favorite topics, which is also the most complex, lighting and how to light your scenes.